few minutes to talk about the news before we get started here. So they got this robot. It looks like a trash can. These things are apparently a hit. They will ghost off you from doing minor crimes, uh, get people to stop graffitiing the walls or something, and they claim the uh, such crimes go down with such robots. People tell me there's some of those in San Francisco. Liz said she'd seen a few of them. So a county prosecutor got a job on the side doing DoorDash, and then he started taking the time when he's supposed to be working at one job doing the other job until he got demoted for that. <coughs> so the part of this that surprises me is I guess you must make some reasonable amount of money doing DoorDash. I always thought these gig work people were not getting much of anything, but they must be making more than I thought. Or this guy must just be stupider than I thought. Uh, this is the problem with cryptocurrency is that the markets are unregulated. And so Coinbase, for example, made two accounts on the markets and they would trade from one to the other to make it look like there was a lot of action in the trading, which is a, one of the many pump and dump techniques they use. Um, the price of Bitcoin is artificially inflated. Most Bitcoin is actually bought by people on the inside with Tether. You heard of the beetle that sold this, uh, people sold this $69 million artwork. Well, he sold it to himself, at least in part. And that's what you can do. You can make it look like it's worth a lot by buying it yourself. So there's, there's a whole lot of those things. Yeah, I saw this one. A drunk man knocked down the security robot. Yeah. In Mountain View. Ah, I didn't know it was in Mountain View. Yeah. Um, that's I've knew, I know some kids knocked it into like a, uh, yeah, 2017. I knew some kids knocked it into a uh, fountain. Yeah. So, you know, they, uh, I don't think they're, they're much in the way of actually fighting or anything, but yeah. Yep. So those things are around, I guess. I'm not sure how much good they do, but people seem to like them. Yeah, NFTs. The NFTs are um, also pretty much a scam. Um, and that's the problem. They're whatever actual value these things may have, it's greatly corrupted by the extremely manipulated markets that are going on. So China arrested the head of Huawei and I mean, Canada arrested the head of Huawei, so China retaliated by arresting random Americans and accusing them of spying, which uh, you formerly worked for the guy, the guy that knocked down the thing. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure whether knocking down a robot is a good or a bad thing, but he might, getting drunk all the time might be a bad thing. <laughs> Anyway, so now they, they've arrested another person, and apparently in China there's nothing resembling fair courts or due process or anything. They just arrest you and uh, put you on trial, and the sentence is already determined before you start and such. They love the run around the Beacon in San Francisco near the ballpark. They're super heavy, so you need help to re-up them. Yeah, I would think so. Well, okay. Neat. Well, I haven't seen one yet. So they're sending up a satellite to try to clean up other satellites. Although it's not going to clean up the current crop of old satellites, it's testing a signal where they're going to put a special a module on every future satellite just for this purpose that can be hooked into by a cleaner later to take it down to try to do something about space junk. So it's good if they can uh, make some progress on that. Space junk is a serious problem. And Monty Python, John Cleese, he drew a picture of... Uh, well, I used to see it in here. Maybe this thing is not. Um, he drew a picture of the Brooklyn Bridge, which for some reason is not showing up here. And it's just like a little line drawing of the bridge. And he uh, put it for sale. And last, it was $50,000. But when I checked, it had gone down a lot. Yeah, down to $33,000. There it is, the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, what do we need to do for ED203.1? All right, let me take a look. Um, ED203.1. Hmm. All right, there's three, there's two, there it is. Uh, the user's value covered by a green flag there. You turn in this screenshot with that. Yeah, that's all. You probably just have to make the window a little brighter to see it. Good, that's an easy one. Yep, yep, good.
Well, I'm glad you asked. It's good to uh, get these things straight. All right. Anyway, we're up to the official time, so let's talk about uh, Windows. So here we are. We're going to do the Windows and then the, the most important Windows class. Did I hear about Google Android apps crashing because of a window update to their web view? No, I don't know about that one. That's interesting. I'll watch for that. Anyway, let's take a look at these Windows slides, and then I have a demo of the most important Windows project. So we'll start with this stuff. So we're going to talk about the structure of Windows files. And if you've taken the malware analysis course, you've already heard quite a bit of this because that whole course is about Windows. And so this will be marginally review of that. But if you're only doing 127, then we've really only talked about Linux so far. So in Windows, um, there's an API. And if you have a Windows program, like a game that opens a window and reads the mouse and the keyboard to do things, it's really doing all that by calling the Windows API, the application programming interface. Um, Windows has, you cannot actually direct talk to the hardware directly in Windows, or for that matter, in Linux. In Linux, you talk to it with syscalls, and the equivalent in Windows is called the Windows API. It's a set of DILs written by Microsoft, and you may have others which are used for things like device drivers. And uh, then you call them. So there'll be functions like to create a window, you call create window, and this is the extended version of this function. And then it has information here like the title of the window and the width and height and other things about it, like whether it's going to have a scroll bar and so on. So you call this function, and that's how you make a Windows. How you, and so everything you do is um, just a series of calls to the Windows API. Now, this, the Windows operating system comes with a bunch of libraries available to do this, and you can see the loaded DILs in Process Explorer. So if you open something in Process Explorer, like here is SVC Host, and if you turn on the lower pane view and look at the DILs, you'll see all the libraries it uses. Here's the Advanced API 32.dil, and here's other ones like CryptBase.dil used to encrypt things, and so on. Here's Kernel32, the interface directly to the kernel. And these are all the libraries full of functions that are needed to run this program. And if another program is launched that uses the same library, which happens all the time, it will just connect to the same library in RAM instead of making a second copy of the library. That's what the DIL stands for, Dynamic Link Library. So it is a dangerous and unsanitary practice, but it makes programs load faster, and it makes them smaller on disk, and it makes them smaller in RAM. So it makes the operating system run more efficiently, unless some hacker starts messing with the DILs, which is usually what malware does. So these are called portable executable files. That's the uh, umbrella term for all the Windows executable files, the XEN DIL. And they can be loaded on 32 or 64-bit versions. Unlike Linux, Windows always supports a previous architecture. So a 32-bit Windows can run 16-bit code, and a 64-bit Windows can run 32-bit code, because Microsoft is very determined to make a legacy support. It's a big part of Windows, because your company might have some software that you wrote 20 years ago on MS-DOS that you're still using, and Microsoft wants to support that as much as possible, because that matches real business needs. All right. And so you can use PE view, for example. And if you open Notepad, you'll see the import directory table, and it will show you all the libraries it has to load. Advanced API, kernel 32, graphical display interface, user 30, user interface, and so on. Um, it'll show you the libraries that are called. And so the file has certain sections. Now, you can have as many sections as you want in a file with any name you want in a portable executable file. But if it's going to run, you typically have to have a text section with instructions to execute and data for global variables, and usually something like a resource section. The rest of this may or may not be separate. The import descriptors could be here, or they could be in another section. And you might or might not have relocation data, but you'll almost always see text and data and resources. So DILs have an address where they would like to load in memory. And if they load there, they'll load fastest. But in case that address in memory is already in use, you can relocate them to another address. And that's what the relocation section is for. That is the list of direct memory references that will have to be updated if you move it to another memory location. All right, let's take a look at the cahoots, which 
I'll put here. Six A is right here. All right, looks like that might be enough. All right, where's the pre-compiled library code? Okay, those are the dills. All right, how about the functions Microsoft provides for software to access the kernel. Good, that's the API. All right, the overall format for all Windows executable files. Okay, portable executable, good. And what section is used for rebasing? Okay, that's relocation. Good. And where are the machine code instructions? In the text section, good. All right, and where are the icons? In the resource section, that's good. All right. Okay, I know who that is. Uh-huh. I don't know who that is. Good. All right. All right. 
So let's go back to here. OK, so imports are uh, functions that it imports from a dill. So um, executables typically have a lot of dills, of the imports, and so do dills. It's when the functions written in this program call a library in some other program. Exports, however, um, are more um, more numerous in dills than exes. Exes will typically only export one handle, which is how you enter and run it. You're only supposed to enter it one place and run its function. But a dill is a library, probably containing many functions, and so it has many exports. You can see them right here in PE view. If you go to the import address table, Notepad imports all kinds of things like is text Unicode and event write transfer from advanced API, create status window from comctl32, and so on. You can see a scroll bar here, many, many functions it uses, but it doesn't have any exports showing up here. Um, all right. And here's the advanced API DIL32 has an export table, and that's where it exports all these functions that are included in this library. So when you load a program, it'll then try to connect to the libraries. And if the library is not already in RAM, it'll hunt for it on the disk. And then you'll often see the missing DIL error. Cannot find this DIL, something is wrong. Um, it's been a problem with Windows for a very long time that it doesn't keep very good track of these DILs, and it often loses them. And that's what they call DIL hell. Um, all right, Stuxnet, for example, was a attack against Iranian nuclear isotope separators. And it had a file here, and it had a funny library here, so that when the Windows XP tried to draw this window, it would load a, a function, and it would load this DIL here. It would load from the USB stick. So just seeing this window and drawing this icon would be enough to run the code here, and that would be enough to take over the box. So it was pretty awesome. At this time, and even now, most you mostly worried about things when you would double-click on an attachment and run it or open a Word document or something, but just viewing the window to see what was on its stick was not considered dangerous, and it was enough to take over the box at this time. So it was a very clever advanced attack, done by the military, of course. Now, Windows executable processes almost always are set to prefer the address 400,000 in hexadecimal. That's where they want to load. But that's, and they will eventually interpret themselves as being at that address regardless. They'll call that their relative virtual address. And uh, even if they're absolutely in a different memory location, internally they'll use that address, sort of like a virtual machine. They have their own virtual address space. And uh, all right. So for example, if I have two um, objects, process A and process B, one goes in 300,000 memory and the other goes in 500,000 memory, if they're both EXEs, they will interpret the address of 400,000 for both of them and just have an offset so that they each think they're running at 400,000 internally. That's how it's done. Their relative virtual address is 400,000. So when you load it in Ali Debug, you'll often see that it loads at 400,000, and you see the code starting here. 401,000 is where the actual text section is. 400,000 itself is where uh, the portable executable header goes. All right, and we so you got heaps. Uh, in Linux, you typically had just one heap for a process, and we exploited it in a previous class. In Windows, it's much more complicated. It uses many heaps. Each dill can set up its own heap, and there are um, complicated functions used in the heap. The same general principles still apply. There can be overflows, and you can take over a box with them, but it gets far more complicated. And then there's threading. Each process is divided into threads so that if one process has to stop and wait for something, like the user input or something, the other parts of the program can move ahead. And the processor gives each thread a few cycles, and it moves to the next thread. So the threads are what actually moves ahead. A process is just a container that contains a bunch of threads. And that's the plan. Um, so you can see them in Task Manager. If you open Task Manager and go to Performance, you'll see how busy your CPU is. This one was 3%. But then it shows you it's running 41 processes, 677 threads in those processes, and 18,000 handles in there. And handles are just every uh, label that is used to refer to part of the code. Like you can open a file, you get a file pointer as a handle to the file, and so on. So these are the symbols used in the file. 
These are the threads that can move forward independently, and these are the processes, which are what you might think of as a program or a service running in the background. Which, these are the containers that contain threads, and the threads are containers that contain handles. All right. And you can view the details about every thread, even down to the handles, in Process Explorer, but you have to be really deeply in the weeds to go down there. And for none of the projects in this course do you really have to do that. All right. Got a few more cahoots here. 6B. All right. All right, looks like maybe this is all we're going to get. All right, so what part of a DIL lists the function entry points? Yep, those are the exports. All right, what memory section is a single block in Linux, but many pieces in Windows? That's the heap, good. All right, which one of these has the largest number of instances? All right, handles, good. All right. And what's the allocation unit for CPU time? Threads are what get their turn getting CPU cycles. All right. Okay, so this is, uh, now we get to DCOM and DCE RPC, and these are really important. This is what makes Windows what it is. Windows is not designed to be a perfect, clean operating system. It is designed to help people make money, to help developers make money, and so it is designed for code reuse to be efficient, even though that creates a lot of security problems. So here's the idea. Um, you, if you want to build something, but you don't want to do all the coding yourself, you can buy code from other people and plug their code into your program, like a module. And so, these COM objects can be written in any language, and they interoperate seamlessly. 
So you could have a module written in one language going to a module written in another language, but the problem is those languages don't really use the same kind of data. A C++ integer is not the same as a visual basic integer, and so on. So you need to have an IDL file, which will have a unique identifier of the module you've created, this thing here, which is 128-bit value in hexadecimal, and then you will have a list of the data structures, of the data coming in and the data going out. So that if you correctly document it, then this module will say, to use my module, you must feed in this kind of data, and you will get out that kind of data. And then it doesn't matter what language it's in if everything is perfect. So that specifies these values for the function, so you can know how to use it. And so you could load it into process space as a DIL. It could be a library. You could load that code and then run it from a, a program that loads its library in its PE header. Or you could launch it as a service. And it would run separately all by itself, and then you'd make calls to it in the operating system. Now, that is much slower, a thousand times slower. But then it's shared by many, um, many processes. So the service control manager is where these things run. You have services.exe is the manager for it. And if you open it, it lets you see the services that are running. And they're just sitting there waiting for calls. Like DILs, they're different than DILs, but they can contain code that could have been in a DIL. So the point of Microsoft's operating system is to make it easy for you to write software and then um, connect it to other software. So you can tell a program to use a different process or even a different machine. So you start with a program that calls a library function. You can easily say, well, instead, go to a service. Oh, instead, go over the network to another machine and call that to get this job done. And um, those are all options. But the result is that code that was written by a developer to be used for one purpose in one application inside that process, just by a library, can then be repurposed and put in a much broader context. And this is like the other big issue which is that people designed networks originally to be just a local area network in one room, like Telnet, was just supposed to connect a dumb terminal to a computer in one room over the cable. So there's no need to encrypt anything. But then it was ported to Telnet over TCP IP and moved over the internet, where the fact that all these passwords and everything were not encrypted was a much bigger problem. But it was reusing the same protocol in a wider environment. And that's what happens here. So. You have the RPC endpoint mapper is listening on port 135, and you can see a call to it with a sin sin ack ack, and then it will do a bind call, bind ack, map request, map response when you try to connect to a shared service on a machine over the network. And if you look at it, the um, map response is down here, and it shows you the number of floors and all these different UUIDs. On this port, it gives you a library. Here's all the services I'm offering with their UUID, and you can call all of them. And a domain controller will offer a bunch of them. A Windows file server will offer a bunch of them. And that's why there are so many um, vulnerable attacks and worms that go through port 135, because port 135 is not just one service, like Telnet or HTTP. It's a whole library of services running there. And if any one of those programs has some kind of weakness, like a buffer overflow, you can exploit it. And a bunch of these things were written decades ago in a totally different context and just moved and repurposed and made available in a larger uh, context here without improving the security. And you'll see RPC is used by almost everything. All these Microsoft functions require the RPC service. You can't really get much good out of your Windows machine by turning off RPC, which is why so many worms spread through RPC. So that's the point. Um, all right, and so there are tools just to uh, re re uh, do a reconnaissance of RPC and fuzz and exploit it. Dave Vitell's Spike, and there are a bunch of other tools to analyze RPC and develop attacks there. Another interesting issue is the token. If you run a program, you can go into um, Process Explorer, and you can see the tokens. Here is the token for one user. C0. It's an address here. And these. this is the token for the user SAM. This is the token for system. So you each process that runs has a integer, which points to a token. And that token determines who you are and what your rights are. 
and you can just steal them from running processes. You can do it with Metasploit. If you get a interpreter shell, you can grab the token from another process and run it. So if the administrator or domain administrator has left some process running on a machine, you can steal the token from it, copy it to your process, and become the domain administrator without ever getting a password or anything. And so that's uh, exploiting token handling. It's rather like a cookie in a website. All right. And then there's exception handling. So if you, something illegal happens with the processor, you try to divide by zero, you try to move to a memory location that has not been reserved for use by this process, you try to execute a kernel command from user mode, that causes an exception. And when an exception happens, Windows then um, calls the exception handler. Now the operating system can handle exceptions, but programs have an option of including an exception handler. And then it will first go to your program's exception handler in case the developer of your program did plan for this and prepare to handle an exception. If the programmer did not, then it will go to the operating system, which will then pop up a generic error message from the operating system like this application has stopped or perhaps even the blue screen of death. So you can see them in the debugger. And we'll see the exception handler is just a series of addresses. It will run this code first. And then if that code doesn't handle the exception, it'll go to this one. If that one doesn't handle it, it will give up and pass it down to the operating system to do whatever it wants to about it. And we will find that there are overflows where you can modify the exception handler, and that's another way to take over the machine. All right. And so if you want to exploit this, you could overwrite the pointer to the SEH chain to point to some other code and then trigger an exception. Um, you could overwrite the function pointer to the handler elsewhere or overwrite the default exception handler. If you can do any of these things, then when you trigger an exception, it will go to an address under your control. All right, and so you need a debugger. We used GDB on Linux. And in Windows, uh, Soft Ice is an old one, used to be powerful. The main ones we're going to use are WinDebug and OllieDebug. Um, WinDebug is the strong one used by Microsoft to debug the kernel. It is not very friendly. It's almost a command line tool. Uh, it's gotten a little better with the new one called WinDebug Preview, but it's still pretty clumsy. But it is the one used internally in Microsoft, and it's probably the most powerful. Ollie Debug is very easy to use and a favorite by hackers for years, and the related product Immunity Debugger, which is essentially the same thing. Ollie Debug 1.10 was very nice. Ollie Debug 2 was the upgrade. It was pretty bad. Um, it gives very misleading results. I've had some students claim that it's not entirely false, but it gives. it's very hard to understand the result. It looks like it's just missing things, so I've never used it. It's very bad. And But Immunity bought the code from Ollie Debug, and presumably continued developing it, so Immunity is probably a more polished thing. It's essentially identical to Ollie Debug in all purposes. Um, although tonight we're going to use Immunity because we need to use its ability to extend with Python modules, which um, does not seem to be true in Ollie Debug, and we need to add the Mona Python module to it. So we're going to use Immunity tonight. All right. Anyway, they all look about the same. You load the code, and in this pane you will see the assembly code with addresses, raw hexadecimal bytes, and then assembly language instructions. Over here you'll see the registers, which are just like we saw in Linux, EAX and EBX, and here's the instruction pointer, Here's the base pointer and the stack pointer. This is the stack, showing us 32-bit words and showing where it points to, if it can understand it, if it can tell where it's going. Here's the return value from this module to return to somewhere in the NT dill. And here's just a place where you can dump any part of memory you want in hex. You'll have addresses, hex dumps, and also ASCII, so you can dump from any location to see what's stored there. Down here, you'll see the last message telling you what's going on here. Some process was paused. And here you see the most important thing of all, whether your program is running or not. When you first load a program in a debugger, it stops and it's paused. Just like GDB, remember GDB was the same, it pauses until you, until you run it, it's not running because you load it in a debugger, presumably to make some kind of a customization. And the same thing's true of immunity. So when you load a program, it's not running, it's paused. You have to run with this run button and then it will say running before you can use it. All right, so let's take a look at the last cahoots, which is 6C right there. Good. Thank you. 
right. All right, where do you find the inputs and outputs of an object? The interface descriptor language file. All right, which one is 128 bits? Okay, that's it. The universally unique identifier, which is, by the way, not all that unique, but anyway, that's what they call it. All right, what structure is used when you divide by zero? Okay, that's the structured exception handler. All right, which one listens on port 135? Okay, that's the RPC endpoint mapper. Which one is 32 bits in size? That's the token, although I, I'm always confused about whether it's really a token or just a pointer to the token that's 32 bits. But anyway, this is a fairly common statement people make. You only need to copy a 32-bit value to exploit a token in either case. But I think what you're actually copying is, in fact, a pointer. Anyway. All right. And what debugger can debug the kernel? All right, that's wind debug. All right, so. Okay. All right. 